Hi everyone, it's Dr. A, and in this video, we're going to be talking about genetics and heredity. And we'll also talk about the use and implementation of the Punnett square. If we were to look at each of our somatic cells, which is another term for our body cells, we'd find that within them, there are a total of 46 chromosomes. Now, these chromosomes are an exact copy of the 46 chromosomes that we had when we were a zygote. But what we want to give notice to here is that these chromosomes are grouped into pairs. So in terms of pairs, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46 chromosomes. So let's explore the idea behind chromosomes for just a moment. Now, if we were to delve into the structure of the cell, we might come across a cell that is prepared to undergo DNA replication and a cell that is not yet prepared to undergo DNA replication. And what we see with each of these individual cells will largely depend on where the cell is within its cell cycle or life cycle. For a cell that is not yet ready to undergo cell division and or replication, we will see what looks like a web of material within the nucleus called chromatin. But when we see this material, referring to the chromatin, tightly wound, we begin to see distinct structures known as chromosomes which indicates that the cell is ready to undergo cell division and or replication. So in essence, chromosomes represent a neatly organized and condensed package of genetic material, whereas chromatin is a loosely organized package of genetic material that looks like a web of fine filaments. And the term filaments here just simply means thread-like structures. So as we continue, what we'd also see is that the chromatin material is wound up by a protein structure that we call a histone. And there's another term I'd like to put before you too, called a nucleosome. And this simply represents a strand of DNA or genetic material that is wrapped around a histone. And if we could unwind this genetic material and stretch it out, we'd find that it contains a DNA helix. And just for note-taking purposes here, keep in mind that helix means spiral change. And as you may know, we typically refer to DNA as a double helix, meaning that it is a double spiral shape. And as we stretch it out, we'd find that this double helix contains nucleic acids, which are a combination of molecules that contain base pairs. And we call these base pairs in DNA adenine, cytosine, guanine, and thymine. Now, as it's shown here, what we're looking at is a karyotype. And a karyotype represents the complete or entire set of chromosomes, our 23 pair for a total of 46 chromosomes. So let's take a look at the first pair of chromosomes here on number one. Both of these pairs are referred to as homologous chromosomes, meaning that the two within this pair belong together, partly because of their sharing of the same shape and size. Now, as we continue along this karyotype, progressing through numbers 2, 3, 4, and so forth, we'll ultimately get to number 22. And from numbers 1 through 22, we refer to these as autosomal chromosomes. And here, autosomal refers to the fact that all of these chromosomes are non-sex chromosomes. In other words, they don't represent the determining of our biological sex. Instead, they determine other factors about us as individuals. So with this, we're saying that this last pair here, which would be number 23, are sex-related chromosomes, and they determine biological sex. So if we look at the pair of chromosomes here, we'll see that one is labeled X and the other is labeled Y. Now, one of the things that may help your understanding is that the letters X and Y don't necessarily represent the appearance of the chromosomes. But typically, the longer and or larger chromosome is termed X and the shorter chromosome is termed Y. So imagine that we could zoom in to the fifth pair of chromosomes, and let's imagine that the sequence of genes provide instructions here about the individual's eye color, 
hair color, and blood type. So let's first make note of the fact that on chromosome pair number five, one chromosome is donated by the father and the other donated by the mother. And we see here in this image that both the father and mother have a gene for blue eyes. So this means that the gene is homozygous, meaning that they have the same form. And we oftentimes use the term allele to refer to various forms of a given gene. So expounding on this a little bit, the individual whose karyotype we're examining would definitively have blue eyes. Now, if we take a look at the next gene shown on the pair of chromosomes, we have a gene for hair color, and we can see here that the allele for hair color is different. One is blonde and the other is black. So when we have this, two different alleles for the same gene, we say that this is heterozygous. And so in this particular instance, hair color will be determined by the interaction between the alleles. So there is what we call a dominant allele and a recessive allele. So here's a quick glimpse of what these terms mean before we begin to diagram this process. A dominant allele will do exactly as it's named. It will dominate. In other words, if one allele is dominant, it will be expressed. So for instance, in our chromosome number five image, if blonde hair is the dominant allele and black hair is the recessive allele, the offspring or child will definitely have blonde hair, regardless of the other corresponding allele. And a recessive allele will be expressed only if it is shown on both chromosomes of a homologous pair. One of the things I'd like to share with you after having discussed dominant and recessive alleles is the fact that not every allele can be easily classified as dominant or recessive. But when they are, we can make some unique predictions about an offspring based upon what we know about its parents. And so what we'll look at next helps us to fine tune what we just talked about with dominant and recessive alleles. So to help us make predictions, we'll typically use a coding process. Now in this process, we'll typically use an uppercase letter A to represent a dominant allele and a lowercase letter A to represent a recessive allele. And because we're using these two combinations for dominant and or recessive alleles, we can have three unique outcomes. First, we can have a homozygous dominant allele where there are two uppercase letter A's and we can have a heterozygous matching where we have one uppercase and one lowercase letter A. And in both of these instances, we're saying that the dominant allele will be expressed. And lastly, we can have a homozygous recessive allele where we have two lowercase letter A's. And in this instance, the recessive allele will be expressed. So for example, we're gonna utilize a tool referred to as a Punnett square to help us understand how we can make predictions using this coding scheme. So let's consider that the mother in this example has freckles and that freckles are a recessive trait. So remember that a recessive trait will be shown here as two lowercase letter a's and we'll place one over the first column of boxes and another over the second column of boxes. And let's imagine that the father does not have freckles, which is a dominant trait. And so with this, we'll have two uppercase letter A's, which represent our homozygous dominant alleles. And we'll place one next to the first row of boxes and the second next to the second row. So what we'll do is match up the letters of each box. So within our first box, we have an uppercase letter A from the father and a lowercase letter A from the mother. So here we'll end up having an uppercase and a lowercase letter A in our first box. And if we match up these letters for both rows and columns, we'll end up having the same outcome. And each of the outcomes will tell us that the offspring will not have any freckles. And this is because each of the allele pairings has a dominant allele 
and the dominant allele will be expressed. As we continue our conversation, I'd like to put a few more terms before you. The first is simple inheritance, and essentially, this term represents the process we utilized a moment ago with the Punnett square. And what this role indicates is that we can determine phenotypes. In other words, we can make predictions about observable characteristics using this method. We could ideally use simple inheritance, aka the Punnett square, to help us determine roughly 1,000 or more traits and or characteristics. Some of the characteristics include curly hair, color vision, free earlobes, lack of freckles, normal skin pigmentation, the presence of A or B antigens on red blood cells, and short fingers, a condition known as brachydactyly. And then there are also recessive traits such as albinism, freckles, straight hair, red hair, and the lack of A or B antigens on the surface of red blood cells. So again, these things or characteristics can be predicted using our Punnett square model, but there are some characteristics and conditions that are much more complex. And what we're referring to here is known as polygenic inheritance. Now, this term simply means characteristics that are expressed are caused by a number of genes. And through polygenic inheritance, it becomes increasingly difficult to make predictions about one's characteristics using a Punnett square. And conditions that fall within this category include things such as coronary artery disease and hypertension. And at the same time, although an individual might be at risk for developing one of these conditions, these conditions, like other polygenic inheritance conditions, can be suppressed depending upon the individual's lifestyle choices and or factors. As we discussed a moment ago, our 23rd pair of chromosomes are sex-related chromosomes, and they are responsible for determining biological sex. And the normal pair of chromosomes in males is XY. And because females do not have a Y sex chromosome, their sex chromosome pair is XX. Now remember that our X chromosome is larger and also it generally has more genes than the Y chromosome. And uniquely, the X chromosome carries genes that also impact our body's cells. And when and or if we have these characteristics, they are said to be X-linked. One X-linked example here is colorblindness, and for this, we can utilize our Punnett square to make similar predictions about offspring like we did a moment ago. So right before we get to this, let's use the uppercase letter C to represent our dominant allele, which stands for normal color vision, and we'll utilize the lowercase C to represent the recessive allele, which will represent color blindness. So let's set up our Punnett square. On the top, we'll list the mother's alleles. So notice here that we have an X chromosome that's associated with normal color vision. And on the other side, we have an X chromosome associated with color blindness. So in essence, because we have two X chromosomes, we know that we have a female and or mother in the scenario that is a carrier for the recessive trait for color blindness. Now let's include specific information for the father. On the first row, we'll indicate that the X chromosome is associated with normal color vision. And because the father is a male, we'll utilize the letter Y to denote the Y chromosome. So in essence, what we have here is a male that has normal color vision. So the question we're asking ourselves in this scenario is, what is the probability that the offspring of a father with normal color vision and a mother with normal color vision, but who is a carrier for color blindness, will become color blind. So if we match the box of the first row and the box in the first column, we'll see that we get an XX, which indicates that we have a female. And because we have a dominant allele here, the female will have normal color vision. Now, collectively, we call this a homozygous dominant allele. Now, staying in the first row, let's move over to the second box and or column. 
And here, we're matching up the father's X chromosome with normal color vision and the mother's X chromosome who is a carrier for color blindness. So our pairing here will be two X's with one dominant allele and the other with a recessive allele. And collectively, we call this a heterozygous pairing. Now, moving down to the second row and the first box of the first column, we're now matching the Y chromosome from the father and the X chromosome with normal color vision from the mother. And our result here is the XY chromosome with a dominant allele for normal color vision. And collectively, we'd say that this is a male with normal color vision. Now, moving over to the last remaining box, we're matching the Y chromosome of the father with the X chromosome of the mother, who again is a carrier of the recessive trait for color blindness. And here we have an XY chromosome with the trait for color blindness. And overall, we label this individual as a color blind male. Well, thank you for watching this video. I hope it's been helpful. And if you indeed found value in it, please like, comment, share, and subscribe. I look forward to seeing you in the next video.